Hey, this is Jake with The Verge, and we're here at CES Day 1. I'm sitting down with Raj Haluri from Qualcomm. He oversees their IoT and mobile computing division, and we're going to talk a lot about smart homes and smart cities. Yeah, um, So Qualcomm, you had your press conference the other night, and you announced uh, chips were pretty much everything. Smart homes, smart phones, smart city, uh, cars, drones. Out of all those, which is the biggest opportunity for Qualcomm right now? Uh, we at Qualcomm, we feel like uh, the technology we've uh, invested in in phones, you know, you know, particularly all the connectivity technologies right. and the application process technologies. We are finding applicability for those technologies in many adjacent markets, and uh, you saw us talk about a few of them, you know, automotive and IoT and uh, healthcare and so on. Um, we think that uh, a lot of those markets are already quite big for us. Uh, we actually ship a lot of products in the IoT. Um, you know, we ship, uh, I think we said in the press conference, hundreds of millions of chips already into IoT market. And so what? The home, uh, a big area for us is uh, adding connectivity to a lot of different things around the home. So, for example, um, in China, uh, we sell a lot of connectivity technology, you know, Wi-Fi and processing into a lot of uh, air conditioners, for example. A uh, lot of, uh, you know, thermostats, you know, air purifiers, you know, washing machines, and a lot of white goods. Um, then we also sell uh, connectivity into uh, streaming speakers, um, into uh, connected TVs. And, and that ties so into a big part of what you announced. You have a, a whole reference platform for smart home products. It's supposed right. to scale across these different devices, is that right? Right, so so I mean, if you step back and think about a smart home and think of uh, the products in the home and what kind of uh, technologies are mostly needed in that, what we are finding is that, um, firstly, they need to have the ability to connect mm. um, to the internet, and that could be uh, Wi-Fi, you know, or, uh, you know, to the access point and then to the internet. They also need to have the ability to connect to other things in the house, like a smart hub, or to your smartphone, um, or to, uh, or to, um, you know, the other, like lights would connect to maybe, uh, you know, another control system or to your security system and so on. So what we're finding is in the home, there's multiple connectivity technologies. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee are the key ones, right? So how do you deal with the diversity of requirements, both low power and high power and yep. things that need, you know, just an LTE connection versus things that might need Zigbee or Z-Wave, right. which, right. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think Qualcomm makes chips for. Right. So we haven't announced anything on Zigbee or Z-Wave yet. Um, but what we find is that um, we uh, Wi-Fi and LTE and Bluetooth are actually very big in the yeah. home. Um, and interoperating from uh, one connectivity to the other. So basically most of these uh, connected homes devices in the future will have multiple forms of connectivity. So it'll probably connect to your phone over Bluetooth, to your access point over Wi-Fi, and to maybe a Zigbee hub over, uh, over Zigbee. So we think that multi-mode connectivity is very important. And that's kind of one of the things we announced in our reference platform, is the ability to have uh, multiple forms of connectivity supported in one chipset. Interesting, so how do you decide what forms of connectivity to put in? Because to some extent you're the gatekeeper. If if Zigbee connectivity is built into our smartphones one day, that's going to make that platform and all of its smart home products much more accessible to everyone. Yeah, I mean, there's multiple ways to do it. I mean, it's not necessary to have Zigbee into the phone. For example, you know, you could have, I think that a lot of the endpoints in the home will actually have uh, Zigbee and Wi-Fi or Zigbee and Bluetooth and, and some things like that. So to the connection to the phone, maybe through Bluetooth okay. or Wi-Fi. And from there, it may be Zigbee to the other one. So that's why I don't think it's important to have all of them in the phone, but it's important to have multiple forms in the endpoints, if you know I what I gotcha. mean. I gotcha. Okay. Um, and so the other big thing that you were out there talking about at the uh, press conference tonight is your smart cities products. Right. And I know you announced a lot of low power processors, things that'll be able to sit idle right. for a while at a time. Right. You know, have you gotten to the point where these processors or these uh, chips can last on a uh, very, very low power for a long period of time, because that's going to be one of the big hurdles. Right, yeah, so so uh, what we announced actually is our next generation modem chipsets, okay. uh, which, uh, and we announced uh, a, a few family of them, we announced uh, a versions of them uh, a few months ago at a, a IOE day we had in China. Um, if I step back a little bit, if you think about smart cities, the connectivity in the smart cities is going to be uh, different mm -hmm. in the way the use cases. For example, let's say you are, uh, you know, um, you're like a, you know, water, um, 
like a security system somewhere or your like, water metering system or so on. What happens is most of the time you have sensors that collect the data hmm. and only once in a while you need to wake up and send some information back. So you're not like on all the time like a phone. Right. And the data that you need to send, maybe just a little bursty data, maybe a small part of it, not a lot. So what we've done is build modems now that are able to last on just a, you know, AA batteries for, uh, for over 10 years. Hmm. So what happens is you install these things, they live in the field, and you don't have to upgrade them for 10 years, but they're not on all the time. They're just only on when needed, and, uh, and narrowband IoT hmm. is a standard that's providing that. So if the processors are here, what are the hurdles still to adoption? Because obviously, this is still an emerging yep. field. We don't see it everywhere. AT&T was talking yesterday about how it's testing things in right. a few different cities, but uh, it's not widespread and doesn't seem like it's going to be widespread overnight. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think it will happen, and it'll happen pretty fast. Uh, you know, I think a couple of things. You know, one, the business models need to get worked out, and they are getting worked out, like operator data plans for IoT. How does that look like? And then uh, also, you know, there's a lot of product out there, and installations have to get replaced one by one. But you see it happening fast already. Like, if you upgrade your security system now, you get a new security system that connects and sends you messages and so on. So as the upgrade cycles happen to these products, you will be getting things with a lot more connectivity built in. So do you see the these smart city products like water meters and I, I guess you know traffic lights yep. being part of the same internet of things that is part of our you know security systems and washing machines and smartphone right. do these tie together one day uh, exactly. So, so the way we think about it is we think about what is the underlying technology mm -hmm. for all of them. So we look at the IoT as, for example, smart body, which is all the wearables you wear on the body, smart home, all the kind of connected things you have in the home, and smart city is mm -hmm. all the things that go into the infrastructure. The underlying technology you need for those is basically all the forms of connectivity from LTE to Bluetooth and processing at the edge, because many times you need processing to happen at the end point and they can't just be you know, sensors, because otherwise you have to go to the cloud and come back and the latest is too much. So that we think the underlying technology is going to be very similar. Uh, the end equipment and the markets will be different. So how does Qualcomm decide which specific products to target? Are your partners coming to you and saying these are the kind of things we need to make or, or are you trying to look down the road and see, okay, we want to be in healthcare, we want to be in traffic lights? And so yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. That's kind of what we do, what I do in my job in uh, product management is uh, firstly, the inputs we get are uh, you know kind of all of the above. First, our customers tell us mm -hmm. we want to do that. Then we also look at what's possible with existing technologies and what's possible with technologies a few years from now. So many times we, in, we innovate and push mm -hmm. the technology forward. Then we present to the customers and say, hey, if you can do this, what kind of products would you have? So it's kind of a combination of both the technology push and market pull. Gotcha. Well, thanks so much for joining yeah. us, Raj. It's been great talking with you. Yeah, my pleasure. Appreciate Thank it. you.